Welcome to our um, Farmers Market Managers Open Forum today. Uh, we will be talking about reopening safety plan for farmers markets. As you know, according to New York State uh, forward, all businesses are required to uh, have a customized uh, reopening safety plan. This is to prevent the spread of novel coronavirus among the people, among your volunteers, among your um, um, staff, vendors, as well as customers. In addition, also a well-written and executed business plan can help reduce business liability or farmers markets liability. So with that, um, let me introduce uh, my partners here. First of all, my name is Yarmila Hazler. I am an agricultural educator at Cornell Extension of Monroe County. And my partner is Adrienne Kaplan. She is our IT support in our association and also our, um, our PR person, our public relations. And uh, she will be helping me to co-host the webinar today. Our guest is Diane Eggert um, of Farmers Market Federation. Diane is the executive director and under her leadership, the organization has developed a variety of programs and services to support and advance the farmers market industry in New York State. I'm sure many of, of you uh, know Diane. She's been working very hard with farmers market managers to develop training programs, new market development in partnership with community organizations, um, provided a variety of resources for market managers, direct marketing farmers, and market organizers. While the, once the COVID hit, COVID-19 hit crisis, uh, crisis hit, sorry, Diane has worked to, do, to keep farmers market managers up to date on operational guidelines, assisted in bringing managers together and help each other operate their markets under COVID guidelines. She also created a number of resources for the managers to maintain compliance. And therefore today, she will be presenting or talking on reopening safety plan, sharing the template, resources, objectives, purpose, and what is the part of a uh, safety reopening plan at your farmer's market. Before we started, a little bit of housekeeping. You are all muted. Please stay muted while the presentation lasts. But while, as you are listening, feel free to put your um, comments in chat or your questions rather. Uh, during the uh, Q&A section, section after the presentation, Adrian will read the, uh, the questions and we will answer as we go. Um, so think about what you wanna ask uh, specific to your farmer's market and uh, enter the questions into the chat box below. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Diane. Okay, let me uh, get my screen up here. Okay, I gotta get... Okay, sorry, that took me a bit, but there's so many pieces of this screen that are in the way. Anyways, uh, hello because everyone. Can't hear you. you can't hear me? We can hear you, Diane. Go okay. Ahead. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm sure you're all working hard to keep your markets afloat during this pandemic crisis we're having and trying to keep up with all of the rules and regulations that are coming out from the state as, and especially as we start to reopen and they change. One of the changes was with New York Forward and that's when Governor Cuomo started to open up the state. One of the things he required is that every business must create a reopening plan. And that included businesses that were deemed essential and not closed throughout the whole uh, state shutdown, such as farmers markets. But we needed to create that plan. We have to have it on hand at the market. Should we have an inspector from the state or county come in and ask to see it? 
but we do not have to file it with the state. It's just something we need to have on hand. So with New York Forward, New York State Department of Health created basic templates. From that, the Federation created a template specific to farmers markets and including a lot of uh, examples to help you work through your own op reopening plan for your market. So why do we have these reopening plans? It helps us to think through what we need to do for our markets to keep everyone safe. And when I talk about everyone, I'm talking the farmers and the vendors in your market. I'm talking about your customers and I'm talking about your staff and volunteers. So we need to think through each piece of the plan based on those th three groups of individuals that we're seeing at our markets. And once you've created your plan and as you execute it, it's going to be your de best defense against negative publicity and potential lawsuits. So I don't know about the areas where you are living, where I am, which is in Syracuse, whenever there is a positive case that is identified, they publicize everywhere that person has been. And so we know what stores, we know what um, locations they have been and whether or not we're potentially exposed. That is a bit of negative publicity if that happens to be your farmer's market. So following these guidelines that you've created, that's your best defense to say, yes, we are aware that this could happen, but we follow protocols and so we've minimized the risk. Now, if somebody decides they've, they've gotten sick from being in your market, again, your protocols and your insistence on adhering to these protocols is your best defense against any potential lawsuit that somebody might file against you. So to create the plan, there are basic elements. We need to identify who we are. We need to talk about what we're doing for the people. Remember those three groups how we're keeping the marketplace itself safe, how we're communicating everything, and then how we are screening. So I'm gonna go into detail in each of those elements. First of all, the introduction, who we are, what's your market name, where's the market located, what is the mailing address, who is the market manager, who's in charge of all of this and what's their contact information. If you have a market sponsor that is different from the market manager, uh, and depending on the role that they play in, as a sponsor, you might want to include their contact name and information as well. And then you want to let it be known where your re reopening plan is going to be located so that anyone knows when they're looking for this information, where they're going to find it. I know when I created the, the plan for the Farmers Market Federation to reopen, it stays right here in our office. It, it's both on our computer so I can email it to somebody, but I also have it in print form. If somebody walks in the office, I can hand it to them. So you wanna think about how you are gonna make your reopening plan available. So the first key element really is people. How are we going to manage social distancing? So we wanna think about all the ways that we have to follow. We need to keep our customers safe. We wanna make sure they are social distancing. We might think about putting markers on the ground so they can stand in a line six feet away. We might want to think about signage throughout the market that indicates how we are doing social distancing. Again, your staffing and volunteers also have to be social distanced. So you wanna think about when you are setting up their workstations if you're having one or more work together, um, can you separate them enough so that even though they're together, they're not closer than six feet? Uh, I know some markets have somebody at the entrance to the market, somebody floating through the market to uh, remind customers that they need to stay apart. Again, you've got volunteers in there, you've got staffing, but again, they're spaced. You also want to think about your farmers and vendors. How are you maintaining social distancing with, with them? You're not responsible for them to be socially distant within their booth space, but you do need to separate their booths. So there is space between each vendor. So they're not right on top of one another. We've 
I know this is contrary to what we've all, always talked about with farmers markets, that you want everyone tied together, but in this case, we need to be spaced. Most markets that I'm aware of are using a 10 foot distance between different vendor spaces. If you're setting up in a parking lot, you put one parking space in between each vendor. Also think about customers interacting with your farmers and how are you maintaining social distancing there. So in some cases, you might again put markings on the ground, customers stay behind the line until a farmer asks them to come forward. You can see in this picture here on your right, this farmer has put a blank table in front of his display. Customers can come toward that table, interact with the farmer. The farmer can put their product on the empty table, ask the customer to step back. They put their product on the empty table, they step back and the customer moves forward to pick it up. Same thing with, with um, handling the, the payment process. So this way you're always maintaining uh, social distancing between your customer and your farmer. Another example is farmers will set up linear displays. Rather than setting up their, their display in a U-shape, for example, and in, inviting the customer to enter your booth, you set it up linearly so the customers are not entering your booth. Again, it's all about maintaining that social distancing. You can see in the picture on the left, these uh, vendor booths are spaced. And you can see people in the lines, again, they're all six foot apart. And they're able to determine that because there are markings on the ground showing that. Part of social distancing is crowd control. So you have a farmer's market, you have limited space within that market, you've got to figure out how you're going to control the, the crowds. Many markets are using a 10 foot square space per customer and determining how many customers they can have in the market at any one time. So it, it then depends on how you are going to control those crowds in your market. Some of the ideas that are being used are limiting the numbers that are in the market at any one time. So you have an, a def, defined entrance and exit to the market. At the entrance, you are managing when the next customer can come into the market if you are at capacity. That means you also have, have to have somebody at the exit that is monitoring people leaving so that you can communicate when there's more opportunity for people to come into the market. Uh, many of the markets are also limiting the number of people per family that come in. They ask, have been asking for one person per family. They're asking people to um, share shopping trips with a neighbor. So instead of sending two people, you and your neighbor, just you're coming. So we're limiting the number of people that are in, in there shopping at any one time. Some markets are operating under the shop and go theory. That means you come in, you do your shopping, you don't linger, and you go home. One farmer's market advertised that as, we love you, please go home. And part of that is, yes, we love to have you here, but we also love to, to safeguard your health, so please don't linger and stay in the market any longer than you have to. It also gives us the opportunity, if you shop and go, to allow more people to enter and do their shopping because they are waiting on the outside. So I'm not telling you this is how you have to control your crowds, but this is what you need to think about. How many people can you have in your market and still maintain social distancing? How do you communicate that? How do you manage that? This is what goes into this portion of the, of the uh, reopening plan. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about place and how are we keeping everyone's safe within the market itself. The first thing is face masks. The state has mandated that we are wearing face masks anytime we're in the public. Some people are taking that to mean anytime you're in the public, whether you're six feet apart or not, um, but definitely within a, a, play, a situation where you cannot be socially distanced. A lot of markets are requiring face masks. You have to have one on to be able to enter the market. We do want to, uh, emphasize that all farmers and vendors have to have a, mar have a mask on. All staff and volunteers should have a mask on. Customers, no entry without a mask. Okay, if these are your rules, this is what you're going to communicate. This is what's going to be in your opening plan. And you, whatever's in your plan is what you are going to enforce. So again, 
with the farmers and vendors, put this in your rules. Make sure that they know that this is required and what the consequences could be if they don't follow that. Customers, um, we, we do usually require customers to have a mask on to be able to enter. We know that some people are medically unable and in that case, it's going to be up to in each individual market to determine how they want to handle that. We, we can ask that they find a shield that they can wear that will still cover their mouth and nose, but, but not as tightly as a mask would. Some markets are going to the, to the point where, okay, we'll allow a customer in rather than getting into that kind of a fight. But farmers have the opportunity to say, no, we won't deal, um, sell to you work with you if you don't have a mask on. So it spreads the um, the enforcement out. And then it would, again, it would be up to the individual farmer if they want to enforce that or not. Uh, staff and volunteers, the, with the market, you are required to, to provide masks to your staff and volunteers. You are not required to, to provide them for customers, farmers, and vendors. Farmers and vendors are their own individual businesses and they are required within themselves but you are required with staff and volunteers. You're also setting the guidelines. If you are not wearing a mask, you're not gonna be able to enforce that with your customers or your farmers and vendors. So lead by example. Okay, we also wanna know how you're making your markets contact free or as contact free as possible. Many of our markets are using pre-ordering as a way to make it uh, contact free. That way you can pre-order online, you can pay online, you only have to come in and pick up your product. So it's minimal time in the market. You've already paid, so you're not having to go through that payment process, whether it be cash, cards, or um, some other type of currency. Some markets are using curbside pickup. Look at the picture on the bottom right. This is the Berryville Farmers Market, who did a total online ordering with curbside pickup. So the cars line up to come into the market and volunteers will put your order in your trunk for you. So there's no touching of in individuals, either their, their hands, their uh, payment processes, what have you. In fact, in this case, the customer didn't even have to open the car window to say who they are. They held a sign up in the window. This is Diane Eggert, and they know they grabbed Diane's order and put it in the back of my car for me. I'm not saying this is what you have to do. I'm saying these are ideas that are helping to make markets contact free. Another one that is very important that is actually in the guidelines set up by the state is no touching of the product. Farmers are required to prepackage as much as possible, but also they will serve the public. The, the uh, customer can decide what they want and then the customer or the vendor will hand it to them, maybe by putting it on a table out in front so that they can still maintain distancing, but we're asking customers not to touch. Uh, payment processes need to be as contact free as possible. I've seen a number of different examples of how this is done. Um, one farmer I know in the table that was empty in front of his display, he would put a can. In that can, you would put your cash payment and we are encouraging people to make things even dollar amounts so that change doesn't have to be made. So use that can, you put your money in the can, you step back, the farmer steps forward, takes the can and takes the money out. Uh, we're looking at different payment processes like Venmo, where you don't actually have to touch the, any equipment with your hands to make payments. Snap, and you, especially using tokens, is a bit more problematic and contact free because you can't do Snap online. But tokens are, are wooden. Most of the tokens that are being used in the state are wooden because it's um, that type of material. It really has only a day where it could possibly maintain contamination if somebody is touching it that has COVID. So when you are taking tokens from customers, you can put them in isolation for a day and then handle those. So we're trying to make things as contact-free as possible. 
Okay, you also want to include in your place in the place portion of your reopening plan. What are you doing for sanitary measures? How are you keeping everything clean? So we're asking farmers markets, maybe they can set up additional hand washing stations and encourage customers to utilize the hand washing stations. Uh, the state has made available hand sanitizer to our farmers and markets, and we have those located throughout markets. Uh, this is going to be within your, your plan where are those hand sanitizers and hand washing station lo uh, located. Your bathrooms, if you have public bathrooms, what, what are you using for disinfecting measures? How frequently? What materials are you using? Um, what are you doing to keep your bathrooms clean? This uh, old man Heller had a farm. This was used by the Cooperstown Farmers Market. They put this sign up with this wording in the bathrooms to encourage people to sing this song. Old MacDonald had a farm and they made it for one of their vendors. If you sing that song while you're washing your hands with soap and warm water, then you're going to do a, an effective job to prevent the spread of germs. Well, again, what are you doing in common areas? If you look at the Rochester Public Market, for example, they have two people that are constantly going through the market disinfecting public areas where there's people that are, are touching uh, tables, chairs, benches, um, display counters, etc. How are we keeping those clean? How are we keeping them disinfected? So this is for the market itself. But we also want to think of what are the vendors doing for sanitary measures within their own stall? And one of the things is table coverings. We recommend that you do not have tablecloths, have some non-porous um, tabletop. So maybe it's a plastic table, maybe it's a ta plastic table covering. These can be disinfected in between customers. So you can see in this picture here, this gentleman does not have a tablecloth on his table and he only has one of each product out. So if the, one of the products on his table is something that you want, you can point to it, that's what I want. He has the stuff prepackaged behind him to hand to the customer. So it's contact free, it's no touching, and the tables are um, disinfected in between. Another thing vendors can do is separate duties. Make sure you have more than one person working your, your booth. One person is handling product, one person is handling um, payment processes. So he's handling cash, tokens, credit cards. Uh, if, if they're wearing gloves, gloves should either be changed frequently or eliminated and then just continuously wash your hands. Uh, customers, you know, we, we were, we went into this pandemic thinking that we were banning plastic bags. Uh, and once we got into the COVID pandemic, that has been suspended, at, at least temporarily. We are recommending the use of plastic single-use bags. That means it's not being handled over and over with the potential of contamination. But some customers are still going to come into markets with their reusable totes. And that's fine, but we don't want vendors touching the tote bags. Okay, you hand them the product in its own bag and the customer can put that in their, their tote bag. We don't want the vendors handling people's um, reusable totes. There is that potential for contamination. Again, this, this is what you're gonna put in your, your, under your sanitary measures for place in your re reopening plan. This is what you're gonna communicate to your vendors and this is what you're going to enforce. Communications is the next piece. How are you making your guidelines known? How are you making what you're enforcing and how you're enforcing that known? Um, it's gotta be known to your customers. Facebook is the way we've really seen this being uh, communicated. A lot of markets are putting up their guidelines in their, on their Facebook pages and doing this several days out to opening. Some cases it's, here's our list of rules. Some cases it's, Every day they're introducing a new guideline that customers have to follow so that by the time they get to the market, they know what to expect. They know what the guidelines are. They know what their acceptable behaviors are. They know how to conduct themselves. But also you wanna have signage within the marketplace, reinforcing each of these guidelines, reminding our customers of what the guidelines are and how they need to conduct themselves in the market. These are a few examples. 
the Federation did work with an advertising company uh, and back in March, I guess we started this and we created a series of signs for markets to use during COVID operations. Those signs are online uh, and they are free for you to use, download, print them into whatever sizes you need and want for your market, but they're there for you. Um, an easy way to, for you to comply with signage. You also need to communicate to your vendors what are the guidelines they need to maintain their eligibility to participate in the market and for that matter to keep the market operational and not closed down because we aren't following those guidelines. How are you making those um, guidelines available to your your, your vendors? Is it in your market rules? Are there handouts that you're, you're giving out? Uh, this is a couple of examples that I've seen that, that markets have used, but you want to be able to maintain those communications with your customers, your farmers and vendors at all times. And as we all know, the guidelines are changing frequently as the state begins to open up more and more. So you wanna make sure that you have that system in place to update those guidelines with both your customers and your vendors. And again, how you're going to do that is in your plan. Finally, we're talking about screening. What are you doing to make sure that your staff and your volunteers are healthy when they come to the market? Some cases, uh, they're taking each person's temperature and recording that at the opening of each market day. Uh, that's not a requirement, it's a recommendation, but it is up to you to make sure that they know that they need to stay home if they're not feeling well. Um, note if your volunteers or staff has any signs of a headache, a sore throat, cough, fever, or flu-like symptoms, send them home. Tell them if they have any of those symptoms, don't come in that day. You'll manage without their help that day. You want to make sure everyone is safe. You're also going to maintain records of attendance for all of your staff and volunteers and what the results of those um, screenings were if you took their temperatures, if you asked them you know, how they were feeling today, if they're um, reporting any of these symptoms. It's important that you keep these records because if somebody in your staff tests positive, you need to one, report that to the county, okay? Then they're going to ask you to participate and cooperate with them in contact tracing so they can follow that person's be um, where they've been over the last few days so they know who they need to get in touch with to make sure that they in, in turn can be tested and they're also going to ask to see those records that you ha have kept on the health of your staff okay what days were they there uh, how were they feeling that day did they have any symptoms did they have a temperature and then if that person, if somebody has tested positive, you're going to go back and you're going to disinfect everything that that person has touched. And you're going to require them to quarantine until further tests show that they are negative. I once heard that they have to be negative on three consecutive tests. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but you wanna make sure that they stay home minimally 14 days and then until they test negative. So, these are the elements of the plan. There's a lot of examples that, that can help you to, to determine how you're going to manage your market to maintain the guidelines, maintain those, the, the face masks, the social distancing, the crowd control, the communications, all of those things. If you want to create your own plan, if you haven't done it already, we do have this template online, uh, nyfarmersmarket.com slash COVID-19 response. You can download the template complete with the examples to help you through it. Um, New York State Department of Health has the basic templates for different types of businesses. You can also go there if, and then you can start from scratch to build your own, uh, your own plan. Either way, it, it's, it, it's critical and state requirements, you do have to have that plan developed. And again, like I said at the beginning, and Yarmela mentioned this as well, this is your best defense against negative publicity and against potential lawsuits. So I know I threw a lot at you in a short amount of time, but I do think it's important to be able to get a lot of questions answered. So I'm gonna throw it open now to Q&A. Thank you, Diana. 
Um, that was wonderful. Um, so all the elements um, that Diane covered should be part of your uh, reopening safety plan. Basically, it, the, 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 the plan has three main uh, parts, portions, which is people, places, and process. You can find a template on New York State Forward uh, website if you are struggling, but also um, uh, Farmers Market uh, Federation of New York, there is a template with, with um, specific examples that you can uh, take a look and use. Um, also, of course, you can reach out before we dive into uh, the questions and answers. Don't forget that uh, you can always reach out to Farmers Market Federation of New York for support, as well as your Cornell Cooperative Extension associations or offices in your um, uh, county. Uh, we are all, we've been all uh, going through uh, safety plan uh, writing training. Um, don't forget your vendors, farmers also are required to have safety plans. So um, you might as well talk to them about uh, where they, do they have it and what possibly, what is the portion of their uh, safety plan when it comes to farmer's market. So you wanna make sure that you know they have it and you know of it. Um, and with that, um, I think we are gonna go to uh, Q&A. How about um, Adrian, if you would like to start reading the questions, that would be great. Yes, and we will have these slides. Oh yeah, thank you, Myron, you're amazing. <laughs> okay, so one of the questions, which was partially answered, but we'll just read it. Um, is there a recommendation of percent of normal occupancy that you suggest if indoor venue recommendations are 50%? Um, we had one answer say one person per 10 square feet space in market that works out. That's, that's the recommendation is 10 square feet per person in the open areas of the market. Okay, anything else with that question? Yeah, there is a, uh, in a queue, um, in a chat box, there is from Myron, there is a um, answer, part, uh, answer to that too. A uh, person per 10 square feet of space in the market is uh, estimated, uh, which is 435 people per acre. So let's say that's half of it, that would be 217 people per half an acre, if you think about it, if your market you know, half an acre might be just about sizable, um, good farmer's market. So that kind of gives you an idea of the spread and how people are, the, the crowd, including customers, vendors, volunteers, everybody. Um, here, Mama, you asked the question, what's the best recommendation for multi-entrance farmer's market to control the customers coming and going? Actually, we recommend using one entrance, one exit, blocking off other opportunities for people to come in. That way you have more control. So whether you have you know, barriers or you tape across uh, other potential exits, entrances, but we really recommend that you work with one entrance and one exit so that you can monitor it closely. And Myron added that you can even put arrows on the ground to keep all traffic going in one direction around the market. Correct. Um, Nicole asked, when will we receive the current up-to-date guidelines from the state that include the new changes related to sampling and eating on site? That's a $64,000 question. We were contacted by the state a couple of weeks ago that indicated that we could now open up to sampling and in market eating provided that we can still maintain crowd control, still maintain social distancing. Uh, so it's up to each individual market's discretion whether to go ahead with that or not. At that time, the state was going to begin to rewrite the regulations, but quite honestly, it has to go through so many people's hands, get so many people's approvals and edits that it takes anywhere from two to three weeks to get the writing approved and, and publicized. So I anticipate it'll come out any day now, but it hasn't yet. But we have been given the go-ahead by the state and asked to make that known to our markets. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so then we kind of had the same question about if SNAP ed educators can participate safely at the markets this summer. We have been told that yes, we, we can open up to, to having um, SNAP ed uh, community organizations and so forth can now come into the market as long as you are still maintaining all guidelines. So SNAP ed educators must wear masks. They must um, maintain as contact free as possible. They, they can't have crowding. Um, so they have to maintain the social distancing. So as long as, as everyone that you're inviting in to participate in your market is maintaining that, uh, yeah, we can have SNAP ed and others in the market now. I have, I have a comment to this. Um, it also depends on your phase, uh, reopening phase where you are, because... Oh, uh, that's not actually true. Because oh. I, I, I asked that specific question to the state when they called to tell me that we could do sampling and in dining, and they said, no, they were going to hold that statewide instead of in individual regions. Okay, very good. Thank you. Good to know. Okay, Betty asked, we operate on a city street and washing stations are impossible. Are hand sanitizer stations acceptable? I, I believe so, yes. They recommend the use of, of hand washing stations, but they don't require it. So yes, sanitizer would be the next best thing. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm sorry, is it open for me to unmute myself? Go ahead. Oh, I was just okay. going to Go add to it. I was going to add to that. Um, I'm from East New York Farms. We also operate on a city street. Um, one of our farmers was able to create a hand washing station from um, one of those hand washing like jugs, like water jugs, and they created a stand for it. And we're gonna add water to it and leave soap on the side as well as hand sanitizer. So maybe that's something to think about too um, for the person. Yeah. We Honestly. have. Yeah, we have plans on the Federation website on how to create your own hand washing station. That way you've got to make sure that the jug you have the water in is hand free operation. So the water continues to run, run down and you can rub your, both hands together under the water. Um, you have to have something for the waste water to go into. And then you have to have uh, typically paper towels so that it is, uh, they can dry their hands without somebody else using the same, you know, towel. Yeah. So there, there are guidelines for that on the Federation website under our food safety uh, systems that uh, if you want to be able to create your own, you can do that. Okay, and we'll get all of those in a list when we send out the follow-up to this, all those links. Okay, what are recommendations for food trucks at the market? Are they allowed at all? And how are food, food trucks? Uh, yeah, with, they are allowed. Uh, food trucks were allowed at the beginning because they are considered essential. Food is essential. Uh, they just have to follow particular guidelines. One is, you know, again, the face mask, the social distancing and all of that. But with food trucks, all food has to be handed to customers in a takeout manner. So what, even if you can eat it there, you hand it to them in a takeout manner. You don't allow things like condiments, cream and sugars, utensils, napkins, you don't put those out for customers to help themselves. You put ride that within the container with each order so that there's nothing out there for customers to touch. So back to SNAP. Oh, well, on the chain of trucks, are farmers allowed to have two people in a two person truck slash van? for the reduced capacity in confined spaces, like on the vendor side, is it okay for them to be close together? Well, you try not to have vendors of any kind too close together, but can you have more than one person per booth, per truck? Yes, but that's the individual business's um, decision to make and, and how they're, you know, maybe they're family, so it's okay, it's not a big deal. Uh, if they're not, are they, they should be wearing masks. Okay. But there's there's nothing that says you can't have more than one person in a booth. Um, some people are having issues with SNAP payments. So, Maria says we want to offer SNAP payments, but inputting card info in the flow of wooden coins would be hard with, with restricting their use only once per market day. Um, Wait, can you read that again? So, 
what um, basically how do you deal with reusing wooden coins throughout the market day? Um, again, once a coin is handled, those wooden coins are handled, then it goes into quarantine. Uh, so you want to bring more tokens with you so that you don't have to go around and reuse them for that same market day. But according to CDC with, with wood, uh, it usually only has to be quarantined for a day before the virus dies off. Uh, at this point, there really aren't a lot of other options for SNAP and a central terminal system. We had to get waivers to be able to use the tokens and to be able to go to any other system, we would need to go back through the process of getting waivers. Uh, and that would be a hard, it would be a hard sell because at the time we got it for tokens, they seemed to consider that was the only option that they would consider. So there's not a lot of good options. I, I know some vendors or some markets are disinfecting the tokens when they come in, but still they're isolating those tokens before they put them back in their, in their um, inventory. And if somebody has a particular question on a, a method, you know, I, I can address that, but you know, there's not a lot of options. Yeah, my thought was, uh, I'll just add in, uh, when your comment on sanitizing, it, it adds another layer of uh, action. But obviously, if you can do that, that would um, allow for safe handling within one day. Okay, Scott, it looked like you had a question about uh, layout of the markets. Do you want to just unmute yourself and ask that again? Oh, sorry, we're having trouble hearing you. Um, you want me to read the questions, Adrian? Well, Scott just asked like a very specific question about layout. I think you just need to come closer to your microphone. Okay. okay. Don't think we can hear you right now, Scott. I'm sorry. We'll come back to you. Okay. Um, are artisans or non-food vendors allowed at the market? Yes. Yep. That has opened up. Now we can invite all vendors back. Again, they still have to maintain the same guidelines, but they are welcome back in. Um, but I want to add to this. Sorry, I always keep on adding things. Um, so if you don't forget market, farmers markets are essential because of the providing or as a source of fresh food, local fresh food, fresh food. So that's why they are essential. So if your ratio of your food that you are selling at your farmers market or making available versus your art artisans and crafters starts to shift towards non-food vendors, that might probably be uh, causing a question mark. Okay, but but that's not the case any longer. Yeah. So okay. as long as long as you're a farmers market, uh, you are allowed to to have all your vendors back, even if it, they exceed the percentage of food. Mm -hmm. And now the spacing of of course comes into place as well. So now you have to. No. Space them out. So. That's ex exactly why we say when you bring others in, you still have to maintain the same guidelines. Right. Oh. So. Okay, moving on. Um, question from earlier. If you have a vendor that has participated in another market, this has had do you require that vendor to self quarantine for 14 days without continuing to participate? I'm sorry, you were going in and out at the beginning. I didn't get the beginning of the question. If you have a vendor that has participated in another market, that has exposure, do you require that vendor to self-quarantine for 14 days without continuing to participate in my market? I think that's a decision that each market is gonna make on their own. Do I think it's a good idea? Yes, but I also understand that farmer has to make a living. So maybe it's the individuals that were at that market that had a positive test, stay home and you send somebody else. But I think that's something that each individual farm business has to consider and then each individual market has to consider. That's not something that is at this point in the guidelines. Myron has put a couple resources in the chat on the definition of exposure from the CDC. 
And also he says the definition of prolonged exposure was extended to refer to a time period of 15 or more minutes, um, which aligns with the time period used in the guidance for community exposure and contact tracing. However, any duration to be considered prolonged if the exposure occurs during performance of an aerosol generating procedure. Um, and Myron, if you want to unmute yourself and add anything else to that, go ahead. Sure, I'm sorry for jumping in on these guys. I've been buried neck deep in this stuff for the last three weeks with, with Cornell. Um, so one of the things that we really wanted people to recognize with the presentations we did on the retail side is, if you have somebody walk into your business or come into your market that is infected, certainly there would be a potential um, contact there. But what the CDC is saying is that unless you spent 15 minutes within six feet of that person with no mask on, you shouldn't consider yourself exposed prolong or have prolonged exposure. Um, so, you know, just because you're, and this is just for general reference, just because you're in a store at the same time as someone who's infected does not mean that you have been exposed to the virus. It really comes down to then you should think about who did you talk to? Did you have extended exposure with somebody at that um, particular location? So when you were, you know, when you're talking about a vendor coming in who was at a farmer's market that had a positive test, that does not necessarily mean that that individual vendor has been exposed at any point. But that also goes back to why I say that enforcing your plan, which includes masks, is your best defense. Because if that person was in your market and they test positive, if you enforce masks, you've eliminated, or limited, I'm sorry, you've limited the exposure. Okay, and we have a question about, besides just the wooden coins of SNAP, um, just how to sanitize the machines that you would be putting them in. And we had a response saying, we spray our phone with sanitizer before and after swiping the EBT card, require yep. use hand sanitizer. Yep. Use SNAP, <laughs> it's a good time. I, I've heard that repeatedly, yes. They're sanitizing their, their phone once a customer has had to use it to put in their, their pin. When it comes to sanitizers, we are going to have, or number of farmers, a uh, number of Cornell extensions are going to have a second round of um, um, hand sanitizer and masks drive, including Monroe County. So um, at this time, first round it was uh, strictly farmers. This time we are going to open it also to all farmers markets. So stay, stay tuned. There's going to be some good supply of sanitizers for your markets. And Myron, you said you as well at your CCE are handing out sanitizer masks too. Yes, um, yes, any uh, farmer's market is welcome to come by our office and we will give uh, up to uh, 10 gallons of hand sanitizer out, uh, as well as masks for employees of the market. Again, all of the vendors are responsible for their own hand sanitizer and masks, um, so we encourage them to come in separately to get those. Um, but market managers in our community, and I would assume in many uh, Cornell Cooperative Extensions around the state are happy to give hand sanitizer out for farmers markets. In which, um, which CCE are you at, Myron? I am in Madison County, sorry. Okay. And then we're at Monroe County, uh, Yarmila and I. So. Yeah. If you happen to be in, a, in an area where there isn't an extension office that is handing out sanitizer, you can contact the Department of Ag and they can make sanitizer available to you. It's um, correct. typically being held at the state fairgrounds in Syracuse. So it might be a little bit of a drive for you to get it, but if you don't have another option through extension, then, then there is the option at the fairgrounds. Um, hello, do you know if there's any pickup options for anyone located in New York City area? I don't at the, at the moment know the, of that. Again, you can contact Rebecca Almond at the Department of Agriculture and she should be able to answer that for you. What county are you at? Kings. 
So look up the Cornell Extension Association, local Cornell Extension office, and uh, they should be definitely able to uh, provide sanitizers for you. Um, do you also have by any chance that um, Rebecca Allman's contact information? 518-457-7076. And when it gives you the list of options, she's under the farmer's market or EBT extension, I think is one, or at least it used to be. Okay, I just put the local offices link in the chat so you can look at your the list on a map. Um, okay, so for eating at the market, are socially distanced tables allowed outside of the building for customers to eat, maybe at a 50% of normal occupancy? Yeah, as long as, you, again, you maintain the social distancing, as long as you can manage crowd control. What we don't wanna see is people sitting down at a table at the market eating while we've still got people standing in line waiting to get a, a, a chance to come into the market. So if you can manage the crowd and allow that, you're, you're free to do that. Okay, so say a farmer has 24 feet of table space, eight foot tables, can he have one customer per table? Yeah, you should be able to. But what you're, you're going to do, again, you're going to just have those lines that show where customers have to stand behind. And typically, you have the farmer say, okay, you come forward. So if he has the ability to keep social distancing uh, in that way, yeah, he's allowed to have more than one customer at his table. Okay. I hope I address all the questions. If anyone else has anything, uh, please put it in the chat now or... Go ahead and just ask the question. Otherwise we'll wrap up because we're getting close to one. I'll also try to, when we uh, send the follow-up email, send some more info about local offices and all of the resources that we talked about today. Myron just put the sanitizer request form in for Suffolk County. Thank you. Thank you. Did we answer the question, what's the recommendation for the food truck at the markets? And there was uh, one question regarding the, there was two, two person food truck, can two people be in the food truck together? We already covered that. Okay. I missed that. All right. If anybody has any more questions, um, something specific, really specific to your farmer's market, Go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask a question rather than typing it in. Or it looks like you can also. Email. Yeah, I've put my email address up there. So you can always email me with, with any other questions if you come up with one after we're done. Um, we're more than happy to answer questions. We are very used to doing it all day, every day. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. And um, so this recording is going to be posted on uh, at Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, website. I will share it with Farmers Market Federation with Diane. Um, of course, you can get it upon request. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. And um, thank you so much for participating. Thank you. And thank you, Myron, especially. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Diane, for a great presentation. Sure thing.